research, um, my research is really, really focused on teaching strategies. So uh, almost all of my studies that I've published have been on different teaching strategies. I work with two different age populations. I work with, I work with really, really young students doing storybook interventions to increase language. And I work with, now I work with college age students, but um, what I would call secondary and post-secondary students, um, reading and writing intervention strategies. So these are just words from some of my papers. I was trying to figure out what do I really do? It looks like I do a lot of intervention and a lot of vocabulary. So that's what most of my research has um, focused on. As a teacher, I was lucky enough, I say now, um, to experience most of all the different settings that you can teach in. I taught at a school for the deaf, I taught at a center program, and I did itinerant. So I had a little bit of an experience in all of those areas. So hopefully when I'm talking about these strategies today, you can think about your setting and how these strategies can go into your setting. I know I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but when you think about whether or not we have an issue amongst a group of people, we have to look at what is the national, what is, what is the you know, normal rate of illiteracy in the United States, and then what is happening with our population. Um, as you all know, I'm sure, or very well aware of, it is hard to count deaf and hard hearing students, um, especially under the IDEA law, because our kids now can fall under multiple categories. So there's not good data on our population specifically. Um, there's one publication from seven years ago that mirrors this and saying that, well, it doesn't mirror this, I'll take that back. Readers with disabilities in general in the United States, about 70% of them are not reading at age or grade level. Our population is about 30 to 40%. So it's, it's an improvement upon the population in general. At the same time, 30 or 40% is not acceptable, right? That's, we're, we're accepting that. So that's why we're all here today. do you think college students have to learn from reading? What's the percentage? Anybody have an idea? 
They hate each other. The more language you have when you get to school, the better reader you are. The better reader you are, the more language you take in. So we're not going to ignore that piece. We're just going to put it here and hold it. We know that that's part of what we do. Everybody, maybe not everybody. A lot of people thought that the cochlear implant uh, situation was going to change language learning for deaf and hard of hearing students. And what we know now, and this is pretty recent information, at times, yes, those kids that are implanted early and have all of the intervention and all of the access to um, different types of therapy, they do come into school potentially with similar language as other as a, to, as a hearing child would. But all of that is gone by the time they get to high school. All of that advantage is gone by the time they get to high school. All of that advantage is gone in college. So there's something, there's something more to it. There's something more to the situation. So we, they still have a smaller vocabulary than their uh, hearing child. Also, sorry to say it, but us deaf ed researchers, we had done a very good job. We had. We spent a lot of time fighting about whether it should be spoken language or sign language. Spoken language or sign language. Spoken language or sign language. And we forgot that maybe it's just about being a good teacher. Maybe it's just about <laughs> Maybe that's what it's really about. I've done, a, I've done a few studies, so I'm a, I'm, I'm a sign person. I've always taught kids with sign. That's who I am. It would be unethical for me to go in and tell someone I can teach a child that uses listening and spoken language as effectively as someone who's been trained to do that. Right? I'd be, I'd be willing to learn, but, but that's just me. That's what I've done. So I decided, um, I don't you know if you guys are familiar with the radical middle, so I'm part of that group. Woo! Woo! <laughs> and I thought, you know what, I'm doing a disservice because I do all my research with kids that sign, and I'm not even looking at this population that uses spoken language. And so finally I was able to do a study where I had a teacher using sign, I had a teacher using listening and spoken language, they implemented the strength, same strategy, and guess what happened? Both, both groups learned. Both groups learned. So it really was about the teaching strategy and not about what the modality was or what the language was. So now I think maybe there's a few of us researchers out there who are saying, you know what, I'm not worried about your language and communication modality anymore. I'm worried about whether or not your teacher can implement effective teaching strategies. So sadly enough, there's been 50 years of research with very little research, but hopefully we're changing that now. We also used to look at deaf and hard of hearing kids as a big group, right? And if we look at them as a big group, it, it, it doesn't look that great. But guess what? They're not a big group. We all know that. They're not. They're not. They're barely similar at all. I know every day you go into work and you're thinking, is this one not like this one? Yeah, they're completely different. So what we have to do is look at them in subpopulations. When we look at them in subpopulations, we see, oh, these are the, this is what works for this group, and it's making a difference. Also, that fourth grade reading level thing, uh-uh. It's not true. It's not true. That glass ceiling that everybody's talked about, it's not true. Deaf, deaf kids are going to college at a higher rate than they ever have in the past. And guess what? At least at RIT, they're graduating at a higher rate than hearing kids are. Our kids are doing well. Our kids are doing better than they've done in the past. And you guys are the reason why they're doing well and why they're doing better than they have in the past. So we, at the college level, appreciate that. 
because the kids are coming with skills that are you know, at least equal or not better. So that's a paddle back to you. But I also know at the same time that we all face, we all, I, I work with the students who come into NCID that have the lower level skills. So I'm still seeing those kids and you guys are still seeing those kids, which is why we're here today. So what do we know about deaf and hard of hearing readers? don't know when they are not understanding something. They'll read it and they think they understand it. If you think you understand it, then why would you worry about trying to figure out what you misunderstood? Right? So they're not aware of their misunderstandings. They rely on pictures. So when, when, you're, when you read very, very emergent literacy books, the pictures do help you understand the text. There's connection between the two. As you get older, the pictures are often not um, tied to the text at all. But our students will still rely on those pictures because it's one of the strategies that they have. So it doesn't help them anymore. They're looking at the picture and it's not helping anymore. They tend to be passive readers, so they'll, they'll read, but like we said, they, they, they think they understand it, so they're just kind of reading to get through it. This is something that, uh, you know, is very upsetting to me, but in K through 12, they might spend 12 months a day actively engaged in Chrome. And I wouldn't feel too bad about that, except for in the general ed population, it's still not good that they spend about 25 minutes a day actively engaged in Chrome. So our kids are getting half the time. But they have to read. We have to, we have professors that, you know, teachers that'll say, oh, well, they can't read it, so I just sign it to them. No, you can't do that. They have to read, and we all know that. They are distinctly different populations, and they read in distinctly different ways. And as a teacher, I think our job's not hard enough. <laughs> we have to know all those different ways that they're reading and that they're using their strategies. But that fourth grade class ceiling, it's not true. It's not true of all of our kids, and we need to throw that out and stop talking about it, because it's not true. Well, what do I know about you guys? I know you have to use evidence-based practices in your classroom. I know you have to have that in the space ready if someone were to ask you for it. And I know that we don't have that. Sorry. Uh, we're working on it, right, guys? My research is beyond it, so we're working on it. Um, it is, our, our evidence space is woefully inadequate. But we're working on it. You guys are real teachers, and you have real, real challenges. You have multiple languages in your classroom and in your itinerant settings. Our students now, it's not even about American Sign Language and English anymore. It's about American Sign Language and English and Colombian Sign Language and Spanish and a whole list of languages that you're working amongst. Um, there's a group that we were just talking with recently, and they were talking. They are they're a listening spoken language group, and they were talking about um, how important it is to not only for kids to learn English, which is the, you know the language of instruction and the language of of our um, law in the United States, but they call they said it's also very important for these kids to learn the language of the heart, which is the language of their home, and so they're really looking into how do you do both. And I think that that's something that's a real, it's a real piece of what we see every day now. 
Also, our kids are being served in all these different locations. You know, some of them are in uh, inclusive or mainstream settings, schools for the deaf, private schools, they're all over. And each one of those locations has its own challenges. So itinerant teachers, four things, you guys have to know six different sets of personalities, of principals, that secretary when you walk in the door, you gotta know her personality or his personality, right? <laughs> that person's very important. That is your gatekeeper. Um, so you have to, you're adjusting all day long to these different uh, locations. And also, we, I was just talking with Kara this morning, Depending on where your student lives decides a lot of things for your student. How much that district's willing to spend, what kind of teachers that area has, does that teacher have a learning community or not? And then amplification technology. Our kids are using all these different types of technologies and we have to be on top of all of it. And they expect us to be on top of all of it because we're, you know, we're striving to keep up. So, because I'm a teacher and I love to complain, I don't know if it's a teacher thing or not, I'm gonna let you guys complain for a minute. So I would like you to do, if you could find a partner, talk about three challenges that the two of you have in common. And if, you know, if you're at a school for the deaf and itinerant, you still got challenges in common. And then the two of you make a group of four, and then I want all four of you to pick one of your major challenges you have in common, okay? And then we're gonna do this complaining, and then we're not gonna complain no more. We're gonna be done with complaining, okay? okay I'm gonna let you guys, maybe I want, one common challenge from this side of the room and one common challenge from this side of the room. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hold on, sorry. Oh, and I told Kara, I'm going to make you do this. I'm sorry. <laughs> it is interactive, Kara. <laughs> we were discussing this, uh, consistent use of assistive technology across settings. Ooh, that's a good one. Man, convincing those people to use an FM system. <laughs> <laughs> just, okay, this out of the room. One person willing to share your challenge your group came up with? Target sound. 
present two words. One word, you have the target on me, you say it correctly. And in one word, you say it wrong. And the student can slap the table for the wrong one. Okay, so that's an activity that you can do. If your kids, I, I have taught students, which slapping a table would be not a great idea. Um, so if you, you can do whatever works for your student, um, you know, slapping, you just would get them too excited. So uh, if you can do whatever you want, but them recognizing those two different sounds uh, when you have a target phoneme is what you're after. In American Sign Language, what you can do is you can take one or two features of a real, of a, you can take one or two features of a real sign, of two signs, and put them together and make a made up sign. It's not easy to do as a hearing person when they, you know, American Sign Language is your second language, but it, it can be done. So I'll show you an example. If you do this, that's not a real sign, right? But can you think of what it might be a part of? No. What else could it be a part of? Think. Head. Don't know. Okay. So when you're having them do is really looking at those five features, right? The handshake, the palm orientation, location, movement, non-manual markers and playing with that. And I tried to describe each one of these strategies in enough detail in the slide where you could recreate it in your classroom if you needed to. <laughs> Other activities that you can do with spoken language is cat, replace the the p and it becomes Cat, right? Um, initial sounds and rhyming. All activities that you can do. I don't know if you guys are using a lot of visual phonics in this state, um, but I just took a visual phonics training and yeah, yeah, it makes sense to me. Um, and so, use, so what the research says, and you've got a bunch of uh, citations there, is that deaf students with no functional hearing Young deaf students with no functional hearing can do these activities with visual phonics. Does that mean they can do more than this? Probably, but the evidence base says with visual phonics they can do these activities. They can rhyme, they can do um, initial sounds, and they can do the elision task where you're replacing the sounds. And if you haven't, if you haven't taken a visual phonics training, at least try it and see what you think because it makes a lot of sense to me. And um, for your kids who have to take a spoken foreign language, like French or Japanese, or they actually are creating visual phonics for other languages in the hopes that that will help our kids be successful in other spoken languages. So they have Spanish is already done. Uh, they're working, I think French is done. And so they're working on other languages right now. So if you had the sign all at the top, your phonologically similar sign would be cracker, the same location. And these, these little pictures come from, all of a sudden, it's the ASL clip art. Um, Hamill, Hamill used to sell it, if you can find it. Um, and they have all of these little pictures that you can use to make games and flashcards and Basically, play with language. Play with language. Hearing kids play with language all the time. I mean, that's how we get the word selfie, and that's how we get uh, all of these new words that come out and are put in our dictionary every year, is because people play with language. They follow the rules of that language, but they play with it. So play with English. Play with ASL with your kids. And I know, it, I'm not saying, if, if you're a native, sign language user, it's going to be a whole lot easier for you to play with ASL than it is for us non-native users, but we can plan these things out, we don't have to come up with it on the fly, okay? And you can always reach out to a native user and have them help you, or have them come in and step in and do the activity. But we need to play with language, and our kids need to feel comfortable 
playing with their languages, whatever they, whatever those languages are. Now we're going to pop over to decoding. For decoding, some these are strategies that have some evidence base. So you can you have your studies behind them, and you can bring that into your meetings or to your boss or whoever you're having to defend yourself with. Visual phonics is quickly becoming are probably going to be our first evidence based practice because it has there's so many people doing research with visual phonics right now. Um, lexicalized fingerspelling and chaining, and then iconic and semantic representation. And I'll, I'll get them, I'll go into each one of these more in depth. And then that is the um, the link for the foundations for literacy curriculum. I don't know if anybody's using that in this state or if it's been to one of their trainings. Yay! Yay! Awesome. Um, it is the only you know published curriculum that we have in Deaf Ed that has research behind it at all. There's a lot of curriculums out there in Deaf Ed, none of them have any research behind them. But this one does. So you can feel pretty confident about it. They've been working on this curriculum for it took, oh man, 15, yeah, 7 plus the 3 before that. So 10 years, 12 years, to get this curriculum up and going. And to create that evidence base. <laughs> So let's talk about visual phonics. What it looks like is that it works for kids from preschool to middle school, and it has to be paired with instruction. So it is just a tool. It's not a curriculum. It's not it's a tool. It's a part of a bigger piece, right? So visual phonics has been paired with the foundations curriculum that Georgia State and other universities develop. It also has been paired with reading mastery, which I don't know if anybody uses reading mastery, but it's been paired with that in the research. And what it, we're not really sure how it works, to be honest. It just seems to work. What we're, what we're seeing now in the research is that our ki the kids can do, you can ask a child, like an older child, how do you use visual phonics to help you read? And they're not quite sure. They're not able to answer it. But I, I'm willing to do anything if it seems to work. So, you know, that, that for me is good enough. Um, so if you have a chance to do a visual phonics training, I would highly encourage it. Fingerspelling. So for some deaf hard hearing individuals, fingerspelling seems to be a phonological code for them. We're not really sure how that works, um, but it, it seems to have that kind of um, connection to their reading. So we need to be fingerspelling with them from the time they're babies to forever. I mean, I'm in Rochester. Everybody fingerspells like crazy up there. So, <laughs> so we're good. We have all the fingerspelling. If you want to come visit us at NTID, there's so much fingerspelling. Um, the Rochester method still has its uh, effects in our area. Fingerspelling is a big part of that regional sign language um, situation there in Rochester. But when you fingerspell, you're going to want to spell the word, connect it to a picture, spell it again, connect it to the print. And we're really looking at the shape of the word. We're not really worried that they, at least initially, that they get every letter in the fingers when they produce it back to you, that it has every single little letter, because over time that just becomes that word. So I was, where I used to work with um, kindergarten through fifth grade, and my little five-year-olds would fingerspell seasons, and it kind of, because seasons isn't really, you know, and it kind of just looked like this, but I knew that's what it was, because they'd say seasons, you know, winter, spring, yeah, that's seasons, that's these little bitty tiny hands, right? <laughs> But I wasn't worried that they did seasons. I was more worried that they had that concept of the word and the concept of what seasons were. So you're really looking at the shape of the word and lexicalizing that word. You don't have to read this little story. This is actually from the Foundation's curriculum, so you guys are going to be familiar with this idea, but every time I explain it to people uh, that aren't familiar with the curriculum, they're like, okay. Um, this is the iconic and semantic representation. 
information concept. So essentially, the idea behind it is if you've never heard the sound, how would you know how to produce that sound, right? And how are you going to connect it to a letter because you never, it's, it's not, that doesn't have anything to hold onto in your brain. So what they did, what they decided to do was create an experience that would elicit that sound from the child. So for example, they have the plane and the plane goes mm, and that becomes the phoneme, mm, right? But the kids go outside and they become planes and they fly around the recess, the RE area, and they fly around the classroom and the experience and the kids, while they're doing it, make the sound, and then they connect it to that picture of the plane, and then eventually that plane picture is taken away, and they connect it to the actual letter. So it's, a, it's kind of a bridge between um, when you don't have that sound, it's not part of your world, bridge between that and getting it connected to the letter. It's very interesting. And what they did find is that um, with students who didn't have what they called, they call them eyes only kids, so kids that didn't have functional hearing, what they, what those kids would do is they would make, maybe they wouldn't make the correct sound, as we would say it right or wrong, but they would make a consistent sound. Every time they saw that letter or they saw that picture, it was consistent, and it seemed to, for whatever reason, that became the representation in their head, and it, and it worked. I 
some research, just a little research. Um, but we do like things that are clean and easy to measure because that's how we get published, uh, and vocabulary is clean and easy to measure. We need you guys, okay? We need you. So if you're thinking about it, you can come help us with this problem. In 2006, John Luckner, he's at the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley, he looked at, he tried to scour our evidence base, tried to scour and find out how, much, how many studies had been done on vocabulary. So he found 41 studies. Out of those 41 studies, only 10 of them were actually looking at how you teach vocabulary and whether or not a strategy was effective. And then out of those 10, only two were on the same strategy, kind of. And I don't know if you guys are familiar, but with the What Works Clearinghouse, they are actually our, um, gov not governing body, but the government's established them to help scour the literature and find evidence-based practices for education. And just for the research design that I do, um, and I'll show you a little more about that later, you have to have five different studies with three different research groups and at least three different locations on the exact same strategy to even consider, be considered for an evidence base, to have an evidence base. So that's why we don't have any evidence-based practices, really. So the first thing that has most evidence base for deaf and hard children is using computers for vocabulary instruction. As one can imagine, that's not actually the most effective way to teach vocabulary. Go back to that researcher thing. Easy to count, easy to measure. Computers take the data for you. <laughs> so I can tell you, as a researcher, a research, a good research assistant's hard to find. So if a computer can take the data for you. So I'm not telling you that computers are the best way to do it. I'm telling you it has the most evidence behind it, for whatever reason. Interactive storybook reading, repeated readings or viewings, uh, repetition, explicit instruction of all components of a word, tier vocabulary and chaining, and we'll go a little more in depth with that. So vocabulary games, games are great, computer games are great, guess what, teacher still has to be there in the right time for you. The technology is not effective if it's not mediated by an adult. So it's a really, really critical piece of it. If you, um, this particular website here, if you go to this website, and I try to list the websites out on the link, on the slide so you can look at them later, they actually have um, vocabulary games and sign language there that they created, now understand. It was made in Georgia, so I'm pretty sure there's gonna be some signs that you guys disagree with. Um, I know specifically for Northeast, it's a very different, they're not, really different, but there are some different signs, so I understand that it is made in Georgia. But there's some pretty good games there for younger kids um, just to learn basic signs, and good for families too, something they can do at home. So interactive storybook reading, um, in, your, in the live binder I put in a, um, Brief explanation. In there, it's called dialogic reading. I call it interactive storybook reading because, well, it's a researcher thing. They, a lot of times when I go to sound off my publications, they want me to call it interactive storybook reading because dialogic reading is used in the spoken language and I use it in the sign language. So, interactive storybook reading and dialogic reading are essentially the same thing. So, when you get that paper and you, if you want to use it, it's the same concepts. It's basically using a book as a shared experience. So you're not really reading the book. You're using the book as a shared experience between you and the child. You're asking questions about the pictures or the story. Some books, you know, the, the pictures are good enough to give a story, or some books the students already know the story behind it. And then you're going to use specific types of questions, and you're going to do them in a specific cycle.
So these are the types of questions you can ask or going to ask. Completion, recall, open-ended, WH, and distancing. And I'm going to tell you right now, you have to script out the questions. You have to do it. Don't think that you're going to be able to just pull them out of your head as you're, as you're reading with the students. It's not going to work. We looked at two teachers of the deaf, one using sign language and one using spoken language, and they almost 90% of the time used WH questions. So they didn't use any of the other types. And we know that the open-ended questions and the distancing questions are the ones that are actually going to get that language, that rich, decontextualized language that we want from our students. So you have to script it out. The story time's not going to be easy anymore. Got to script out these questions. What we've done in our studies is we've tried to do each question type maybe five times during the book. And what you do first, before you start to do this, is you go through the book and you pick out what do we want my students to learn. Do I want my students to learn a specific words? So we've done mostly vocabulary words since we've worked with you know, young kids preschool level. But you can also learn, uh, teach um, word meanings. So we've done word meanings with young kids. And you can also teach language structures. Because the point is, you're asking the question to elicit that word or that structure so that the child has many opportunities to practice saying it or signing it during this interaction. And you do this same activity the same way three or four days in a row. And it's not fun for you. It is real boring for you as a teacher. I'm gonna tell you, teachers are like, I don't want to read this book again. But it's really fun for the kids. Because guess what? By day three, they can predict what you're gonna say. And they're like, oh yeah, I can't wait. You're gonna ask that question. I'm gonna have the answer. They're pretty excited about it. They love it, we hate it, oh well, right? <laughs> it's not about us as much as we want it to be. It's not about us, it's about them. So these questions you're gonna write out and you're gonna remember the question is going to pull the language out of the child. So if we want the child to say, um, like one of our target words was ax, because we did Hensel Row. When you say, what is dad carrying? You're wanting the child to say ax. Here's your sequence. Your prompt is your question. So that question that you wrote down that you wanted to ask, that's your prompt, that's your first thing. You say, what is dad carrying? The child says acts or signs acts. Then you're going to evaluate whether or not what the child says is correct or signed. Yes? And then you're going to expand on it. Dad is carrying an axe. And then you're going to go right back to that question. What is dad carrying? And you're hoping, hope against hope, you're going to get more language than you got the first time. So my first study, we just did the prompt piece. Because I was like, ah, this is a lot of work. Whew, that's a lot of things to say. We're just going to do the prompt piece. And it worked. The kids learned. The kids learned the vocabulary. It worked. They were kindergarten through second grade. It worked. Second time around and third time around that I did a study, I added, we did the peer part. So our, these are kids that are in, you know, pre-K. Well, these kids were in pre-K. This is a 20-minute lesson, 15 to 20 minutes. They had 35 questions that we wrote. So in 20 minutes, if you do this entire sequence, they have almost 60 times to say the word or the, or, the, or the sentence or whatever you're trying to target. It's amazing how much more opportunities this provides. Teachers have a hard time coming back to this, sec, this last prompt, but I, I would heavily encourage you to try to follow it the way it is it's set up because it really does matter. It's, it is not fun for us, I'll be honest, but it really is important and the kids really, really like it. This is a strategy really is supposed to be done in the home. So if you can advise parents, this is a really good thing to be done in the home. And you're basing all your questions on pictures from the book. So you're going to look and see what you can find. And acts is one of our words. Um, we did, we did uh, three nouns, an adjective, and a verb. And we had at least one English spelled word for, for signing kids and for the spoken language kids. So they did the same words, I guess, obviously, if you're using spoken language, not finger spelled. But it didn't seem to matter. They both learned equally. For older kids, you're going to put these questions in the text or on a post-it, whatever. And 
you want to make sure that you're doing all the, you know, you're not just staying in this lower level of questioning. You want to start going up into that higher level of questioning. And you guys, I'm sure you probably know about it, but if you don't, New ELA is a free resource that, get, you know, does passages at different reading levels. Um, we've used it in a lot of our studies, and we use it at NTID because they have a lot of STEM and stuff. Um, but it's a pretty good place to look. So this is what it would look like. You have your passage, and then you put in your questions. So they read a little bit, and then you're asking, what is a fast radio burst? They read a little bit, and then you say, Elim eliminate means what? Okay. So you have these. You can have them written along the side, or you can have them on post-it notes on the side. And this actually helps them. It keeps them actively engaged in what they're reading. So, in, since we're talking about vocabulary, you guys know very much about the tiers, right? This is very common. Um, so, our first tier, our middle, that's our high frequency word, right? That's our, our words that apply to all the content areas that your students might be taking courses in. Then, our tier three are our academic words, domain, what we call discipline specific words. They're going to be low frequency. The kids are not going to come in contact with them very much while they're reading. And then we have our basic vocabulary. As teachers of the deaf, we want to be teaching here. We want to teach in that tier two, and we want to use the tier two to teach tier one. So pairing those words together. Right? And then we want to get up to that tier three as much as we can. But we also want, a lot of times maybe we can negotiate with our general education teachers and say, what words do they absolutely need to know out of this list of 20? What do they absolutely need to know? Semantic organization, word webs. These are really helpful because our students sometimes struggle to make that connection. So if we give them an explicit, explicit way to connect that word to something they already know, it's helpful. Word walls or notebooks. All I can say is that uh, have to use them. <laughs> like they're real cute, real pretty in your classroom, but you have to use them. You have to plan activities with them. You can't just stick them on the wall and yay. You have to use them. And once you once you use them in activities and games or whatever you use them in, you'll see the students use them on their own. But they're not going to use it on their own if you don't show them how. We have to show them how. So don't just make them cute. Make them useful. For you guys that are working with older students, vocabulary is very different as you get older. So before, this is a, a they call it a knowledge reading scale. So you give the kids the words down the side, and then they decide how much they think they know about the word. When you're reading narrative as a young child, you can kind of know a word and still understand what you're reading. When you get older, you have to deeply know a word to understand what you're reading. <coughs> not only do you have to deeply know that word, you're not going to see that word or use that word very often, but you still have to know it. This is a very different type of vocabulary knowledge as you go, as kids get older. And then to complicate it even more, because we just love to complicate things even more, all of a sudden, that table that has four legs and holds up books or your Food now becomes a graph in math. So we, we're like, yay, we've got the everyday words. No, now they mean something different. So we have to reteach some of our everyday words because now they mean something different. So vocabulary for older kids is different. So what can we do for that? Nagy, all the way back in 88, came up with this idea. We have to relate what they don't know to what they do know. So remember that word web, right? We have to give them many opportunities to use and see the word. We don't know how many times. We don't know that. We know kids with learning disabilities have to see and use the word about 30 times before it becomes part of their internal vocabulary. But we don't know for definite. 
And then we have to have meaningful use of that word. We have to use these words in like in higher order ways. We have to model for our kids how to figure out what words mean. Oh, I'm reading this book and there's this word. I, I don't know what constellation means. What does constellation mean? Can I look at the sentence and look around the word and see if it'll help me figure it out? Oh, no, that didn't help. Well, let me look at the word part. Well, I know so constellation, I know stella means stars, so this word might have something to do with stars. Oh, I can go look it up in the dictionary. We have to do that whole thing. Your acting skills. Put on your acting skills and model for our kids. It's awkward. It's not fun. I can't even pay my student teachers to do it. <laughs> they just, they just, I have to keep, I force them to do a modeling activity where all they do is model because it is such an awkward feeling thing. But it's so good for our kids because all of that language around how I figured out what that word means, they need to see and know that language. We're not magic. They think we're magic. They have no idea how we get there. So we have to show them how we get there, even if it's awkward. Fisher and Frey say, why reading? Our kids need to read and read and read and read and read. A ninth grade student has to have 88,000 words in their internal vocabulary to tackle the text. Ooh, that ninth grade level. Sorry. A little tr trigger finger there. Got a little happy. <laughs> so our kids just need to be reading, period. If they read on their own an hour a day, five days a week, they would hit two million words. Out of those two million, they'd probably be repaying about 2,000. That's better than I can do teaching one-on-one, -on -one, 2,000, right? Also, why do we always have to pick the words? They can pick the words. They can look at a text, and, and I understand we have to control some things. Actually, we love to control everything. That's why we became a teacher, so we can run our own little country. Um, <laughs> I say that all like, yeah, that's, that's why I became a teacher. I don't know why they think that we, oh, you should collaborate. Yeah, teachers are great collaborators. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's why we got into this, so we can collaborate. We didn't get into this to collaborate. We got into this to run our own little country. <laughs> right? Except for some of you are probably lovely collaborators. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> so if we have to control it, you know, maybe they pick five and we have five. But think about this. They're picking the word. They show you where they found it. They tell you what they think it means. And they tell you why it needs to be on their list. Now they have buy-in. This is their word that they wanted to They have a list of words. I just made up some teachery words over here. They define the words. They put them in pairs. So they put two words together. They write a sentence. But they don't write just any sentence. They write a sentence that they think they might find in that text that they're about to read with these words in it. Then they read the text. They compare their sentences. Now, I presented this. I can't remember where. And the teacher said that. My kids can't do it. No, not tomorrow they can't. No. We have to teach them how to do this. But imagine if we expected our kids to do things like this from day one, where would they be? And if we don't think they can do things like this, nobody else is going to be. So will this be fun when you first try it? No. It's not going to be fun. Your kids, our kids are going to really struggle. But that's okay. It's okay to let them struggle. Struggling is learning. Okay? So I know it's hard to watch. I've been there. I don't want to watch. They're so cute. I don't want to watch them struggle. But they have to. 
And I'm, I'm not saying, I'm saying six, eight months before they're able to do this on their own. The value of this, the value of a strategy like this is amazing. So I presented this last week in the Netherlands and another researcher stood up and said, I tried this and they were trying it. I'm just telling you this because it, it to me it was like, a, oh, that makes sense. She was, um, she said they tried it with content area stuff, so maybe like a science text first, and the kids really didn't get it. And so what they did was backed up and did it with a story, just a narrative first. Great, I mean, I should have come up with that on my own, but I didn't. Uh, Dr. Sherry Williams came up with this, and she said that really helped them bridge between being able to do the strategy, you know, with being able to apply the strategy to a content area text. So maybe the first time you do it, start with a story they're very, very familiar with, and that way they can see the connection. Let's see if it's gonna work.
taught them the word, uh, the word meaning. We taught them the morphemes and the morphing meanings. We taught them how to break it apart. We showed them how to put it back together. We taught them the rules for breaking apart and putting it together. So there's 12 rules that you can teach. And then when they put it back together, we help them look at the sentence around it to see, oh, okay, does my meaning that I came up with make sense? what it looks like. So this is actually one of the slides that we used to teach it. We did the discussion piece over here on the side that you see because it doesn't always work, right? Not every word that has C-O-N in it will have the, the, the with or together, right? It doesn't always work. So that was our way of saying, okay, so you came up with this word, and I, yeah, you're right, it has C-O-N in it, but yeah, in this situation it doesn't work. There, I went to... Uh, all the big people that do morphology research. I went to one of their papers and our paper talks at one of the huge conferences that they have. It's called ARA and it's like 15,000 people. And I went there kind of uh, just to see the big names, right? That's all they really look like. Um, and someone said, well, you know, words have changed so much over time and the meanings of words have changed so much over time. Is this really an effective use of of a student's time to teach them these, these word parts. And the, the researcher that was there, um, Amanda Goodwin, she said, you know, you're right. They have changed a lot over time. Except for at least this way, your student has something, right? It might not be perfect. It might not be the exact definition of the word, but it's more than they had. And I agree, it's more than they had. It's something. All right, I'm taking away your activity because it's all about me. <laughs> <laughs> I told you we were going to get through this whole thing, and now I'm not so sure we will. Okay, here we go. Reading comprehension. All right, we're not going to ignore the fact that grammar and reading comprehension are tied. We're going to talk about it for this moment. I, you, we have to teach our kids grammar. We have to. We know if they know the words, that's great, but if they don't know how the words relate to the words around them, we have a problem. So we need to be teaching grammar, and grammar has an influence on reading. Vocabulary is the most consistent predictor of reading achievement for deaf and hard of hearing kids, but you remember about us researchers, why you think that's the most consistent? We never really looked because we never really measured their grammar. Easy. Because it's hard. So we measure vocabulary because it's easy. We can count it. Grammar's hard. Um, I think they're just now, you know, really starting to look at grammar um, interventions for little kids, and it's messy, but it's working. What they're doing is working, but it's really, really messy. And I'm not glad I'm not part of that group. But that's hard. What can we do for reading comprehension? We can teach them comprehension strategies, for example, summarizing, paraphrasing, inferencing, passing. We can teach these things. How do we teach it? So, you could give out a passage. This is a teacher passage, obviously. You could give out a passage to your students, or you could give a pa passage to your one-on-one your -on -one if you're an itinerant, and you'd say, write me a summary. What do they do when they try to write that summary? What skill do they already have? Is there something they already have that we can capitalize on? A lot of times we look at what our students don't have, what they can't do, what they aren't doing, but what are they doing? Did they skim it? Did they read it? Did they write on the text as they were doing it? And then ask them, what did you, what did you do when you were writing that strategy? How did you find the main idea? Was it hard? Was it easy? That way we can find out what they already have. Let's capitalize on their strengths, right? Talk about deficiencies too much. Let's capitalize on their strengths. And then what do you do? Back to that modeling thing. You're going to have to show them how. And while you're showing them how, you're going to have to show your thoughts. 
You can do it different ways. If you're signing, you can make different spaces. This is me, and this is my thoughts. What I do is I look up, like, oh, I'm thinking, and I sign whatever I'm thinking, and then I come back. So I do some shifting. With spoken language, you'll have to find a way to let them know that's what you're doing. And then you practice. Guided practice, right? You have to assign it regularly. So we are not great. At, well, we're great at teaching strategy. We're not great at revisiting that strategy again and again and again so that they're using it over and over. We need to make sure that we find a text that aligns to that strategy, so they're forced to use that strategy. Because one of the things that we haven't gotten really good at is going, getting to the point of telling them, okay, so here's this text, it has this type of structure, so what strategy might be your best option? We don't get to that piece because we work so hard on strategy. But then they don't know how to pick from their toolbox, right? We have to help them pick from their toolbox. What do you do when you inference? They have to go through that text and find the clues to get the answers. They have to take those clues and connect them to what they already know, and they have to be okay with being there's more than one possible answer. Our kids, I don't know about y'all, but our kids don't like that. They're like, no, what is the right answer? I just want the right answer. They have to be okay with it's more than that. And then they have to support it from the text, right? They're Okay, so, so this meme fell flat in Holland and Amsterdam. They're like, I don't know. Like, oh, I'm such an American right now. Uh, <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> we can't rent them all, right? <laughs> this idea is from Reading Rockets, and I'm sure you guys use Reading Rockets for different things. I pulled this because I think it's a really, really structured way to help kids make an inference. I probably, I didn't change it because I borrowed it, but if I was actually teaching this, I might change the, it says, I say, and so, because I'm not sure for our kids that's clear enough. We would have to really structure that language so it's clear what you're trying to do. But you, you, you put your prompt in the first box, and then they go through and find all the information in the second box that's gonna help them answer that question. And then they add their own knowledge about what they just, in the third box, and then in the fourth box, they're actually citing the evidence of what they mean, of what they, what supports their hypothesis. I'm just madly throwing teaching strategies at you, but they're all in the live binder, so go back and find them later. This is a study that we did, and it's called Comprehension Check and Repair. We were, um, replicated this study from another uh, research group. What it is is they break up reading pass, they go through a you know, reading passage and they find places to stop. You can set it up if you want, we let the kids pick. They go through and they read up to the point that they maybe put a star and they're gonna stop here. And they ask themselves, did I understand what I read? If they feel like they understood it, then they write an I know or I understood statement. If they don't feel like they understood it, they write a question about what they were reading. And then they keep reading, and when they stop again, they go through the whole process, and they also go back up to see if they can answer any of the questions that they had before. So it kind of looks like this. You have your passage. They stop. Did I understand what I just read? Yes, I understood that fast radio bursts come from other galaxies. They stop again. Did I understand? No, and then they write a question. They can write on the text if you, you know, have paper, or they can do it post-it notes. So when we did this, this is what happened. <coughs> Feels like the same board. Yeah, you can see. Because like we learned before, at that dotted line, if you look, we have, uh, there's two kids in each of these, uh, in each, group. So that dotted line that is got a closed um, symbol, so black symbol, no white in the middle, should have jumped up. They should have been able to understand more of what they read. And they didn't. But I'm not 
convinced that it was that the strategy didn't work. I think it could have been possibly that when I brought this to our research group, that we, when we do studies, we bring them to a group of people and say, what do you think? How did we get these results? So we can contextualize what we have learned. Different thoughts. Um, I do a lot of research with an astrophysicist because at NCID, we have people of all disciplines working in one building. And so the classroom, the class that we were doing this in was an astronomy class. And there's potentially they just didn't have enough background knowledge to tackle the text. I mean, I didn't know what fast radio bursts were, so I, how much would I have learned too? So when you're working in isolation as one person and you're thinking about your own thinking, maybe you just don't have enough background knowledge to, to learn from what you're doing. Also because we didn't, you can see we didn't do the strategy, we, these classes meet two days a week, and because the strategy didn't seem to be working that well, we didn't want to keep eating up the kids' time doing something that may not be working. Um, we only did the strategy for three or four sessions. So maybe they were still concentrating so hard on the strategy that it didn't help their comprehension because the strategy wasn't internalized yet. Maybe. And maybe it just doesn't work. I mean, there's that piece, right? It might just not work. Um, but what we did see was a big change in reading behavior. So before when they were just like, oh, okay, yeah, uh -huh. yep, I know. They were actually stopping, they were thinking, they were writing. So we did see a big change in reading behavior. <clears throat> what was also interesting is you see that top line, there's, they're kind of separated. That line is where we asked them how much they thought they understood from what they read. Right? So of course, they did grossly overestimate how much they thought they understood. Like, I understood 100% of what I read, really understood about 10 but what you'll notice is that there is it, it, the two lines track, meaning that when they didn't understand something, they at least assumed, okay, I thought I understood about 70% of it, and really I understood about 7%. So they tracked along. So even though they still overestimated how much they understood, they still were aware of some of what they were misunderstanding. So that was very exciting for us, because we wanted to know if they were recognizing when they didn't understand things. Again, back to those embedded questions. You can ask reading comprehension questions too, so not just focus core vocabulary. And this is what it looks like. You have your preview question at the top. What do you think this passage is about? And you have add your other questions. And you're going to ask different types of questions. So like, do you think all discoveries in astronomy eliminate theories that from the past? It's also important for us to teach story elements. You guys probably already know this. You're going to want to teach them what characters are, the setting, the plot, you know. That's a very important thing for our kids to know, and this has evidence behind it that it helps them understand what they're reading. There's also an activity, it's called Directed Reading and Thinking Activity, but it was modified when it was um, done with deaf and hard of hearing students. So what you'll do as a teacher, you pick out a text, and you go through yourself and set up places that you want to stop and ask questions. It looks a lot like guided reading, which I'm sure you guys have implemented before. So you have them look through the book or the passage and you're asking them, what do you think this is about? And the child tells you bees. And then you ask them why. Why do you think it's about bees? And they give you an answer. And then you, you're, you're using what they're saying to, um, sorry, lost my train of thought. You're using what they're saying to keep building questions as you go along. Graphic organizers, I know you guys probably do tons of graphic organizers. Graphic organizers are great, but we have to show them how to use them when we're not there. Which graphic or organizer do I pull out and use? Right? So that's our, our piece. And we can do graphic organizers with <clears throat> young guys and with older guys, but they have to know when to use them. Visualizing to know what they see in their head, that movie that they're making. We should ask them questions about that movie because maybe that movie's not accurate. Um, when I was teaching uh, students, they were, the 
the story was about a squirrel, I can't remember exactly. And this was in America where kids see squirrels, I know there's countries where there's no squirrels, so that's understandable. This was here, and there's plenty of squirrels for kids to know about. And when I asked about the movie in my student's head, he had a pink bunny there. Because his pink bunny at home was named Squirrel. <laughs> okay, but had I not asked, I wouldn't have known that there was some misunderstanding happening based on him having that fixed um, meaning for squirrel. It was important for us to ask. For our older kids, <coughs> things get complicated. This is my everybody's a reading teacher, and don't think you're not one, please, because you are. If you're a scientist and you teach science classes, you should be teaching your students how to read like a scientist. If you're a mathematician and you're teaching math classes, you should be teaching your kids how to read like a mathematician because they all read differently. Historians, mathematicians, and scientists read differently. Mathematicians know there's lots of symbols. They have to know the meanings for their symbols, and there's a lot of mul multiple meaning words in math texts. They also ignore who writes. They don't care who the author is. It's not important to them. Historians really care who wrote it. It's very important to know who wrote the text that you're reading. And it's very important to know what was going on at the time that the text was written. But nobody in math cares about that, right? Scientists, a lot of what they read is cause and effect structure. The structure of what they read is cause and effect. And they don't care who wrote. They care what lab it came from. How are our kids supposed to know all of this? I didn't even know all of this. I had to learn this. So how are our kids supposed to know this? So if our science teachers aren't teaching reading, we need to encourage or empower them to do that. And maybe it's more empower. English language arts teachers can't do the whole gamut, right? So what can we do to help reading comprehension and older kids?
can't believe it isn't there. Nobody ever just says a simple thing of that that's right there, that's the that's the word we're looking for. So just t- teaching them how text uh, textbooks in particular are set up. Teaching them how text is structured. Is it a cause and effect? Is it a sequence? Is it a problem and solution? Teaching them to recognize the way the text is structured from keywords that are in the text, or even what discipline it's from. Remember we said science, law, cause and effect. Can bring them to these graphic organizers that will help them. So we have to teach them this part. Remember we did that study and we thought maybe because they didn't have enough background knowledge, that's why that strategy didn't work. So we back them through on the board and we found this strategy, collaborative strategic reading. And I do believe that you can do this, you know, in an itinerant setting. You're just gonna have to be the strategic reader that works along with your student. So what you do with collaborative strategic reading is you put kids in reading groups of mixed ability level. So you're gonna have a high, your high reader and your low reader, they're all gonna be in the group together, about three or four students. And the first thing they do is that dreaded KWL chart. So you have your passage, KWL chart, but they're all doing it together. And then they read the passage, and when they're reading, they pick out the words they don't know. Then as a group, that's this side over here, there's four vocabulary strategies that you've already taught them, and they already can use on their own, and as a group, they try to figure out what those words mean that they didn't know. Maybe it's that this kid knows it, and this kid doesn't know it, but this kid can explain it. You do have to roam around, because things can uh, go off the rails. We had the word uh, spectrum, it was spectrum, that was the word, and one of the kids said, oh, spectrum, that's like specter, that's a ghost. The kids were like, oh, okay, yeah, ghost. And then like, okay, so this is astronomy class. That's a ghost. That must mean space ghost. Okay. And they just went on. Like, they, all right, space ghost. That's what this means. And we were, oh, 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 wait, wait, no, not space ghost. <laughs> no. So we still have to be there, but we're giving them, we're kind of empowering them to help each other. And, you know, there's not space ghosts, so. Sorry to disappoint you guys. I mean, I can text the astrophysicist and ask him, but I'm pretty sure there's not. So we did, we, all, we did these from passages from New ZLA. They have a lot of content on astronomy. And we shortened the passages. And uh, they were given to the students at a fifth grade reading level, which was kind of mid-level for the group. And then we made sure that they had headings and pictures. It's really important to have headings and pictures because that's a big part of previewing text. And that's text books. <coughs> text books have a lot of that too. And what we found was, this looks all researchy, yeah. Basically, it didn't have a significant impact on their reading comprehension. But we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I think we measured reading comprehension. It's the way we measure reading comprehension in this particular study. We just did overall reading comprehension. And I'm not sure that this doing this for 13 weeks is gonna improve their overall reading comprehension, I think it probably improved their understanding of the content for that course. And we didn't test that, so we're actually doing it right now again, and we're testing the content of that course. No activity for you, because it's all about me again. And you wanna learn about fluency, right? You have five minutes to learn everything you ever want to know about reading fluency. Kids that use spoken language, you can do running records, oral reading fluency, that's the words per minute thing. You probably see this heavily used in elementary schools. Computer days assessments, Ames Web, they have all these different ones, and Maze. Activities. For kids that sign, reading fluency is a real puzzle for us. Um, some of the things that we can do with kids that sign is use their silent reading fluency 
as an indicator rather than their through the air rating galaxy. We also can do these slash tests. So they, they, they're slashing where the words are. <clears throat> maze again, I'm not showing you maze if you're not sure what that is. And then the sign reading fluency screener. So this is a maze. And if you notice, as you're reading along, there'll be three words in parentheses, and they have to pick, they have to pick the uh, correct word. And they have three minutes, and they get as far as they can go. What I will say about this, because I did use this when I was teaching, you do have to teach them how to do this, because it's not a, it's not a natural activity, right? They'll get to, they'll get to um, parentheses, and they just don't know what to do. So you have to teach them how to do it. But once you teach them how to do it, it's, they, they do well. This is being used heavily in a couple of schools for the deaf out west. Sophomore, in Colorado. Really, we don't know that much about fluency, to stay honest. Um, you can do repeated word lists, like repeated readings of word lists. You can do repeated readings of passages. You can do both. We really don't know. We know for hearing kids that the fluency, when they're reading something, that word for a minute, that's a predictor of their reading comprehension, right? So. That's why they use that task so often, because it's a whole lot easier to measure than actual reading comprehension. They use it as an indicator of their reading comprehension. But we don't know with kids who are deaf and hard of hearing if it really is an indicator of their reading comprehension. We don't know that for sure, because of the way that our kids read is, is different. But what, one thing that you can use, and this is in your, uh, oh, and another thing I put in your packet is uh, there's some talk now about doing repeated readings of common phrases. So I put in your, on the live binder, I sent in a common phrases so you can cut them out, flashcards. It's just something so when they see those phrases, it becomes a chunk of text that they can quickly go through. Um, and also, you know, be part of like, you guys do the, they call it bridging in Fairview, but that concept of multiple words and a different number of signs, you can do that practice really quickly. And then I also put this in your binder. And this is the, the sign reading fluency screener. It's not going to mean much to you. You're just looking it up here. It's a little two-pager action. It's front and back. And what you do is you give a kid the um, you give a kid a book at their at their independent reading level, and they sign the book, and you look for these different aspects. What they found in the literature or the research that behind this is that they the score that they get on this is correlated with their actual reading comprehension. So the belief is, is that these parts, or assigning kid at least, are part of their reading comprehension. So role shift, all of that, is part of how they read. And so what, what we've been really successful, some people have been really successful in using this to write ASL goals for reading. Because you can find their weak areas, and very specifically, like maybe they don't use classifiers at all or they use them very minimally. You can use that. So this is in your live binder too, the front and back. And there's also a set of guiding questions that go along with this to help you separate out each, what is the use of space versus sign space. So those questions, they really help me. Even when I use this, I still have to go back to those questions to make sure I'm thinking about the right part. So different things that you can do. Essentially, more time they are reading, the more fluent they are going to be. I know I keep saying that, and I know I keep pushing it. They have to read. I know it's hard to watch sometimes. I know sometimes you just want to get it out there. They have to read. But you can have them make their own goals. They can graph their own thing. They can graph their own um, successes. If we had time, I'd have you summarize what you've learned today with this beautiful acrostic, but we don't have time. But you, on your own, if you want to, you can totally do it. And then you can always email me with questions or needs. If you need evidence for what you're doing, I'll help you find it. I'll
send it to you. If you're interested in research, doing research in your classroom, I'll help you do that. If you want to get your PhD, I'll help you get there. Okay, I'll, I'll advise you, I'll help you, I'll support you. Um, the sad thing about RIT, we have really weird email addresses. Don't ask me why. Uh, it's not just our names, like everybody else, we have these weird ones. So that's my really weird email address. <laughs> and you're, you're really, you're 